for the reading of our text. We have two of them, 1 Samuel chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, and then Matthew 23, 24. So, 1 Samuel chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. It's so good to have all of you with us here this morning. Some of you haven't seen in a little bit, and I'm really happy to see you again. A couple of re praise reports. I don't know if you know that Brother Isaiah got the Holy Ghost this morning before we even got into the second song. <laughs> Great is the Lord. Also got a report from Sister Molly. She calls me over and she says, hey. I don't have cancer, just like that. I said, um, I said, what do you mean? You, what, what happened? Went to the doctor, and they looked at her, and she had the surgery. When they were looking at her, they came back and said, you got some nodules, but you don't have any cancer. Well, I know that she did have cancer, but I know that my God healed her. How many know he's a healer? <laughs> Not the first time. We've had cancer healed here. <laughs> he can do anything. Amen. First Samuel chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. When the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli, verse 15. Now Eli was 90 and 8 years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also... Hophni and Phinehas are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass that when he made <clears throat> when he made mention of the ark of God, not his sons, but the ark, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck broke. He died, for he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel for forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas, his wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, when she heard that the ark was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, she dies doing this, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. It's all right. The lineage will continue, right? But she answered not, neither did she regard it, that it was a son. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed for is from Israel, for the ark, they repeat it, for the ark of God was taken. Matthew chapter 23, and verse 24. You blind guides, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and he's right in the middle of a very fiery message. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. I'm going to preach this morning. It's his message, so by his mercy and grace, the most important thing we are missing. The most important thing that we are missing. Lord Jesus, I love you, and I'm grateful for your move this morning and for all that you have done up to this moment. But this is the moment when you're going to speak. I pray you will anoint these lips of clay, your message alone, and I pray that each and every person in this house this morning is ready to receive your word today to themselves, that you, O oh Lord, will help all of us to grow in grace this morning through your ministering of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Let's lift him up before we sit down and praise him one more time. You may be seated.
to quickly clue you in on the, on the issues going on in 1 Samuel 4, and it will continue on. The same issue really is talked about for a couple of chapters. Hophni and Phinehas were no good. Eli really wasn't either. He had not served God correctly, but the Lord had raised someone up that wasn't of Eli's lineage. A boy by the name of Samuel that you know very well. One of the most important figures in the Bible was not supposed to be where he was. God took him out of a place, made a miracle out of his birth, and then delivered him, hand-delivered him to the temple to a man that didn't know what he was or wasn't doing what was right. He knew he wasn't doing what was right. And his sons were, were ruling the temple. They were literally uh, having sexual intercourse with women that would come there to present offerings and forcing them to do that in order to give the offering. That's how bad these guys were. They were doing a lot of other things too, cutting off part of the offering that was to go to God. They took it and ate it themselves. This is highly unholy. So when he got to war and you have all this issue going on and there they die. And not only did they die, but the ark is taken. The ark of the covenant. Does everybody know what that is? It represents to Israel the presence of God. And it's taken in battle. It's not stolen. It's taken because they're defeated in battle. They couldn't even defend the ark. The ark was supposed to go into war to give them victory. But God wasn't going to give victory to anyone who was doing what they were doing. So the ark is taken by the Philistines. And this is what we get. We get what I just read was the return of one guy that managed to get away. And he comes back and he tells Eli. And Eli falls off and breaks his neck and dies. It just keeps being awful. It just keeps being awful. Then this woman, Phineas, Phineas' wife, one of his son's wives that had died in battle, she gives birth to a child and she names him Ichabod. Now, it's not her job to name her child. It's supposed to be the father, but the father is dead. Matter of fact, everybody's dead that could name the child, so it comes down to her. And she's dying. All she can see is her death and the death of her loved ones. All she can see is what she's going through. And in the midst of this, she names the child Ichabod. The name Ichabod means the glory has departed. The glory is gone. Now, even if she has no choice, and I don't think she did, she comes down, she's the one that's got to name the child. Nobody else is good enough left to, to name the child. Even if that is the case, it is not her right, listen to me, to say that God's glory has departed. Look, they took the ark, and so in a sense, his presence is not there. But can I tell you more of the story? The Philistines take the ark of God, and they put it in the temple of Dagon, their primary God. He's a, he's a man uh, fish, kind of like a merman kind of thing. And they put him... They put him in there with Dagon. They come in the next morning, and Dagon's falling on his face because that's what happens in the presence of God with enemies. However, they don't get the clue, so they pick Dagon up again. Must have been a mistake. A little bit of wind last night, maybe some earthquake. We're just going to pit him up, and they put him up again. So God makes sure they get the message the next time they come in. The next morning they come in. Dagon's not only falling down, but his head and his hands have been taken, listen, have been taken off the statue and put on the threshold. That's not even, I've heard and I've preached that it falls and breaks. That's not what it says. It says they've been removed and put on the threshold, the head and the hands only. I, I, you can read it later. Samuel says that from then on the Philistines would not cross the threshold. They wouldn't go to the threshold no more. I think they were a little worried. Scripture says they were a little worried. They said, what are we going to do with this ark? Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to take it and we'll send it to such and such city. Ekron, I think, was the first one. Five cities they send the, the ark of God to. And in all five cities, disease hits everybody. Emrods, the scripture calls it, which is a much nicer word than hemorrhoids. Which is probably what it was. Tumors, at least, grew inside of their bodies. So they send to five cities, and in every city, people are dying. And the people that don't die get the emrods. It gets to... It gets to the point that the next city sees the ark coming and says, no, they're bringing it to kill us off. What's wrong? The message it got through. So they got together with their best guys, and they said, what are we going to do about it? You can read all this in 5 and 6 of 1 Samuel. They said, well, we're going to tell you what we'll do. 
We're going to make five golden emeralds. You're going to do, you're going to do what now? And we're going to make, and we're going to make, we're going to make five golden mice because we're having problems with that. And we're going to put them as a sacrificial offering in this ark, and we'll put it on a cart with two milk cows, and 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 we're going to send it on its way. We are tired of this. The world does not know how to worship God. They have no clue. And when they get together with the best of them and they come up with ideas, this is the kind of idea they come up with. I want you to notice what they're doing because that's the message this morning. Because it's, uh, it's not just sometimes the unbeliever that doesn't know how to worship God correctly. They said, we're going to take this thing that's bothering us and we're going to make this a thing. And put it in with the presence of God. Because the important thing to the Philistines was the problems. So they get it and they put it on a milk cart. Got a couple of milk cows. And they do this thing. They do this thing. I love this. If the milk cows go straight, then this was God doing this to us. But if the milk cows don't go straight, if they, you turn, which they're more likely to do, being cows and unled by a person then it was just a coincidence. Even in the end, they're trying to pull that. What do the milk cows do? Anybody want to take a guess? Bible says that they went straight mooing all the way. That's what it says. And right on down they went. The Bible says when it got to the end of the Philistine land, crossing into where God's people are, that the first town that it comes to, they see it. They see the ark coming, and they rejoice. And they get the ark over to them, and they're real happy. And they kill the cows. The poor cows, they do nothing but what they were supposed to do. But they kill the they, but, but see, the people want to make a sacrifice, and that's not a bad thing. They're trying. They're trying. Listen to me. I'm not saying that I ain't always trying. They're trying to do something right. So they offer up the, the it is an offering and whatever. But the Bible says, you can read it. The Bible says they looked in the ark. You ain't supposed to look in the ark. And as we already know, you can bring, this is what this comes to way later on when David, you know, remember that? David dances before the Lord and he brings the ark in correctly. All that happens way later. This is what's happening that leads to it. Just in case you didn't know the story. The fact of the matter is that these guys did what they knew was not right to do. There wasn't an Israelite one that didn't know they weren't supposed to go and touch the ark and look at it. And the Bible says that God struck the city, the Israelite city, started wiping them out. And he told them, it's because you looked in the ark. You knew better than what you were doing. I tell people all the time, especially when somebody who is probably related to me or at least Someone that, you know, grew up, my parents, or something along those lines, and they see me, and you hear the story, and you're like, oh, you're pastoring now. Just like your daddy. You always were a good boy. I just absolutely don't know what to do with that statement. Is it because I'm a good boy that I'm doing what God's called me to do? Well, that can't be true, because I know a lot of not good boys that God called and turned into men of God, and that, that can't be it. It's their, it's their way of trying to say that I belong in a place. We have to make sure we line everything up so that it makes sense to us. That person is healed because they have faith. That person is not healed because they don't have faith. We sound an awful lot like the people that were around Jesus all the time. Who sinned? Him or his parents? Because somebody did in order for him to have this sickness on him. Because sickness equals lack of faith. You know why that's real bad? Because then when I'm not sick, I get to act like I'm holy. That's why it's worse. Because I can walk around and go, ha, 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 well, you know, if they live for God the way I live for God, I'm serious. It's God, it's not me, so you can't get mad at me anyway. Ichabod, the glory has departed. But the Bible says that Ichabod had a brother. Did you know that? And his name was 
Ahiab, Ahitub, I don't know. I can't speak English barely, so forget it when it comes to Hebrew. But do you know what his name meant? My brother is goodness. No, but Ichabod, the glory has departed. The brother's name is, my brother, Ichabod, is goodness. Do you know what it would be like to be called Hitler your whole life? Right? How do you expect your child, <laughs> reminds me of, of the song a boy named Sue. How do you expect, you better toughen up because you're going to have a rough life. It's bad enough being called star. Look, I'm telling you, I have more grief from the name than anything else. And I would not call myself Clifton, which is my first name. Why? Because I didn't like it. I like Star. So I put up with it. I put up with songs dedicated to my name. I did. Ain't just one. There's two of them, by the way. One of them less offensive than the one you actually know. That's the worst one. Oh, she thinks that's hilarious. Now I've reminded her of that. I never shirked away from my name. I liked my name. I thought my name had promise in it, so I kept it. I called myself by it. I insisted, literally, that other people call me by it. Every time I'd get a job, they'd go, Clifton. I said, no, I don't know who that is. Don't call me that. They'd make me write it. It's your first name. You have to put it down. I can't stand that rule, by the way. Cannot stand it. You want to talk about something that doesn't make any sense? You must call it you by your first name. No. Why can't you just do it by the name I go by? I'm writing that name down just like the other. It makes no sense at all. One of those rules that doesn't have to exist but does, and everybody's got to do it. I don't like those kind of rules. I like rules that make sense. I do. I don't have a problem with rules when they make sense. I got problems with them when they don't. He says, <laughs> I am, my brother is goodness. If I'm going to get anywhere, if I'm going to get anywhere spiritually, I'm going to have to come to the realization that just because my brother is called Ichabod doesn't mean he is. Just because my brother or sister is struggling does not mean that they are unrighteous. I'm not going to be able to have revival. Church, we're not going to have revival. He said, well, we're doing pretty good. Good. we got to stay on it. We're nowhere near what God's called us to do, right? We're never going to get there if we hate on our brother. If we talk about our brother and sister. It is the very first thing that has to happen. This is how you will know that you, they will know, the world, that you are my disciples by your love. One. To another, you're not going to get a witness until that's settled. Talking with somebody recently, not from here, somebody recently who was talking great about their church and their church was good, this and that and was going wonderful and and it, and I was I like I like it I like it even if they're not us I like it when churches prosper don't like it when they don't much like. Home businesses. I do not like it when family, mom and pop stores fail. I don't like it at all. Never have and I never will. It's a better way. So when they fail, it's not a good sign. When churches fail, it's not a good sign. They may need more of the truth. They need, may need to be revived. I'll give you. They don't have it all, but they don't need. I should not be desiring that they die. Because the alternative is worse than that. Yes, it is. But he was talking, and he said, yeah, we were starting to fall apart, but we got, we got back together because we got a good preacher. We got a good preacher. Now, I don't know who the preacher was before, but he just got a bad witness just then, didn't he? It was the other guys or whoever, girls, I don't know, they, didn't, they weren't doing it. They weren't cutting the mustard, but now we got a good preacher. Can I tell you something this morning? I want you to hear it from me, right from me. This church does not grow or succeed because you got a good preacher. No, we think it is. Oh, yes, we, oh, Lord Jesus. We go around and we lift up people's names. You know, such and so has got a healing ministry. Such and so is a powerful preacher. Such and so can do this, that, and the other. And we pick them out and we got ten people. When we got hundreds of guys and gals that can preach and spread the gospel and do the message. And we say, you're not quite good enough. Who are we to call that? 
And by the way, nobody has a healing ministry. Healing comes from God. It doesn't come from people. When somebody gets saved, that's God doing the work. That's not you. When somebody gets the Holy Ghost, that's God filling them up. That's not you. And when you preach good, honey, that came from God. It did not come from you. And the moment that we start putting ourselves in the place of God, the more we do it, the less we can be used. The more we do it, the less he's going to use us. Yeah, but I'm a really good singer. Ain't going to matter. I don't care if you make an album and the album is successful. You weren't. Because God was calling you to something deeper than that, and you missed it for yourself. I used to not know what to do. People would come up after, they go, that was a great message. Or more often than not, that was a good message. I usually get a great And And when I was younger, I didn't know what to do with it. And so I would just say, it's God, it's God. God did it. That's a good answer. When I got older, I realized I didn't have to tell them that it was God. I know it's God. They know it's God. I don't got to remind them that it's God. So I would say, thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad that he used me. But something else developed in private. And I think I've mentioned it before. I don't know, but I'm going to say it now. If you would be preachers, listen to me. Everybody that ministers, listen. Now I have a habit. When I'm getting the message, of course, I'm talking to him. I want his, I want his will. I want his mind. I want, and I can't get that unless I'm paying attention. It's, his ways are so far above ours. And I can't preach me and just what I get because it's not going to help anybody. And so anyway, I, I've been, I'm in a habit now before I get up to preach. When I say, the Lord, let's pray, that's not a tradition. Like, let's lift him up before I start to preach one more time before you're seated. It's not a tradition because while that's going on, I'm doing this. Lord, let it be your message and nobody else's. You receive the glory, listen to the wording, for it. Now, when the message is over, when this is done today and every time I preach, before you get to me, because some of y'all get to me quick. You slow that down a little bit. Give me a minute. But before you get to me, no matter how fast you move, this has already happened. I thank you for the message that you just gave to your people. Thank you for using me to deliver the message. And in that way, by doing it before and after, I keep myself in the proper place that I'm supposed to be in. When I sing, it's for his glory. When I preach, it's for his glory. When I witness, it's for his glory. When I praise, it's for his glory. <laughs> Remember this morning, we're talking about the most important thing that we now, somebody else are missing. Now, this brother, this brother whose name reminds the other brother that it ain't all over with, and, and you, you have goodness in you. This guy, Ahiatub, has a son. He has two names in the Bible. It's the same guy, Ahijah and Himalet. They're the same. The word means, the name means brother of God. Do you see the growth here? Do you see the growth? Now, this guy's name is, I'm a brother, not of somebody else. I'm a brother of God. This is the same one that gives David Goliath's sword, feeds him the bread, and gives him a word from God when he's running from Saul. Says so That's that guy. Hanging out in the land of Nob. And it goes south for him in 1 Samuel 22. We're not going to read it. It goes south for him. Because this idiot named Dog, I like to call him Dog, but whatever, it's Dog. The Edomite hears it, goes back and tells Saul. Saul calls Ahimelech before him. Now this is the same Saul that in the past, where we read at the beginning of 1 Samuel, he uses that as an opportunity to get the people right. When that, when they, that city touches, touches the ark and it kills everybody, Saul says, hey, that's because you got these Philistine gods in your life. Get rid of them. It was a good moment for him. And, and he, so in that moment, he was right. But when we get to chapter 22, Saul's the Saul that all of you know him to be. He calls a high priest before him and murders him. 
Nobody will lift a hand to kill the high priest because nobody's as dumb as Saul. But Dog will do it. There's always a dog that'll do it. Now he killed 40 some people, so they stood there and let him kill them. He probably had help because he then went to a city and wiped every killed men and women and children. These are Israelites. Wiped them out. One guy gets away. One son of Ahimelech gets away and runs to David where David's hiding in the cave and becomes kind of the friar tuck of David's group. He becomes the preacher for the group. He takes him in. Later on, this man becomes high priest. But he doesn't do everything right. The Bible says that he was the one that stands against Solomon. When Solomon is to be crowned king, he probably thought he was right, but he wasn't. And he ends up dying for it. Because guess what it comes down to? It doesn't come down to your name. It doesn't come down to what somebody else says about you. I love that. I had to do this bad thing because somebody else did a bad thing to me. Is not Calvary. It's not Christian. You don't understand the bad thing they did to me was worse than anything that you've ever had happen to you. Well, I'm glad you're God and you know my life. But it could possibly be true. I have been blessed. But it still don't make it right to do wrong. It's not the name that matters. It's the choice. Your choice, my choice, is actually what matters. When God created the world, he did not remove our choice. It would have been a lot easier for him to do that. One of the biggest arguments that we get with atheists about creation or about God in any way is they will come to you with this. And you'll hear it echoed in people who aren't atheists who are just wondering. And they'll say, well, if God, if there is a God, then why does he allow suffering? Have you heard that? They believe it to be a strong argument. If they're an atheist, they believe it to be a strong argument against the existence of at least a good God, the one we talk about. And how do we answer them? Well, God is good, we will say. We know what Calvary is, and he didn't have to do that. And we can lay groundwork for them using the word, but it's word that they don't even believe. They don't believe that's the word of God. So we're trying to talk to them about something that they themselves are not only unaware of, but don't want to listen to. The real problem becomes that there's something much deeper than this, and we cannot relay it to them, the lost, in a way, especially un an unbeliever, in a way that they can grab it. I was talking with Bishop the other day. We were talking about how that sometimes the Lord has to let people get really way down before we'll turn to him. Some people just won't turn to God unless the whole entire world has fallen apart on them. So God does that. Is he an unjust God for doing that? Why are you saying no? Because why? Not because we know he's a just God. Don't do that. They don't know that. What's the real reason? What's the reason we can tell them that even if they don't accept it is a, a absolute truth they can't do anything with? Because he's sovereign. He does what he does because he's God. I can see some of us remain a little unconvinced. Can't, Brother Starr, I just talk about his love? Sure. Absolutely. If love is all they'll listen to, talk about love. If they can understand. Do you remember the Italian centurion coming and he said, he said, I'll go with you. And the Italian says, you don't got to come with me. If you'll just speak the word, then my servant will be healed. I know this because I know what authority is. Do you understand? Somebody that understands authority comes to God a whole lot easier because he understands that God doesn't have to explain himself to anyone at any time about anything he does. I don't like that. I don't like it because I want to have a say in the matter. 
You do have a say. Your choice is the say. It's not going to change what's right and what's wrong. It's not going to change that he's God and you're not. But it will choose for you what side you're on. Nobody does that choice but you. Your parents can't do it for you. Up until a certain age, they can, which, was, which is why it's called that, that age of understanding. They, they, but when they reach that age, and around here it's usually to get the Holy Ghost when they reach that age, honestly. Now the choices they make are on them. I don't have time to get into that. How about Lazarus? How about Lazarus who knew Jesus, who was close to Jesus, had an actual in-depth relationship with Jesus, and the Bible says that Jesus found out he was sick and he waited. Would you wait? Would you wait if it was your brother? Well, hang on. Would you wait if it was your brother and you knew that when you prayed for him, he would most definitely be healed? Let's go there. Let's go there. There's no healing ministry but God's, right? I already said that. Would you wait? No, you would not. You'd been on the you'd had them sandals on and been gone with a little dust cloud. Everybody, disciples keep up or not. My brother that I love needs me. But the Bible says that Jesus waited for the glory of God. Nope, we ain't getting it yet. We ain't getting it yet, but we're going to get there. He didn't. <laughs> you know what? You preach my message every time I preach before I get there. <laughs> Isaiah 42 and 8. You boys keep up with me. <coughs> Here we go. Isaiah 42 and 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Will Jesus give you his name? Yes. Will Jesus give you authority? Yes. Will Jesus give you power? Yes. Will he heal you? Yes. Will he save you? Yes. Will he deliver you? Yes. But you don't get his glory. Oh, that's nice, Brother Scar. Glory in the Hebrew is kabob, which means honor. You do not get God's honor. His honor rightfully only belongs to him alone. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or you drink or whatsoever, you, which means anything that you do, do all. To the glory of God. Are you eating to his glory? Are you drinking to his glory? Or every single thing you do in a day. When you put on your clothes. <laughs> ah, we're going to close. Oh, Lord Jesus. When you put your clothes on, do you put them on to the glory of God? No. Or the glory of you? You look good. I'm setting you up. But you look good. I mean, really, honest. You got some tight people this morning. Keep it up. It's good. I like it. But if you wear a tie, does it make you holy? If you know how to coordinate your look, is, does that make you better than the guy who can't? It does to us. Yes, it does. We judge everybody by this outward appearance. Somebody comes to preach, we look him up and down. Uh, we've moved away from some, and being apostolic, we've been away from some stuff for a long time. In case you didn't know. Just in case you didn't know, okay, racism in the apostolic church went out a really, really, really long time ago. Because this was this 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 organization founded by a whole bunch of different kinds of people. They weren't all one race. <laughs> at the same at the moment it started, they weren't. We even had one of them up preaching when the black man came in and sat down, and the Lord says, "I want to give him the Holy Ghost." And this, and the southern white guy had to fight it. It was not even near Jim Crow times. Okay, it's way before that. And he says, "Really?" And he says, "He's mine, just like you're mine." And guess what happened? Racism went out the window. Because if God tells you they're the same as you are, who are you to argue with him? 
Who do I think I am arguing with God about it? Well, God can't use him because he's fat. God can't use him because he's ugly. God can't use him because he sounds weird. God can't use him because he acts weird. Are you kidding me right now? John the Baptist ate locusts and honey and dressed himself in camel hair. We get caught up. We get caught up. One thing bothers me. I wasn't taught it. Thank God it doesn't happen. We get preachers preaching, they go, ha, huh, at the end of everything they say. The Lord, ha, huh, loves you, ha. Huh? Is it, do you, do you have a breathing problem? What's, but I know one of my favorite preachers, a young guy, does this because it's just how he was taught to preach. I got to get past the ha. Huh. But when I get past the ha, huh, Jesus talks to me. No, nope, not there yet. Let's keep going. Philippians 2, verse 9 through 11. Wherefore God also has, has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is, we quote this every week, which is above every name. Next verse. That at the name of Jesus, every, every, every knee must bow of things in heaven. What? Every knee in heaven must bow to the name of Jesus. Just said that. And things in the earth. I love this. Things under the earth in case you thought something was missing. Next. Next. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So this Lord causes every knee in heaven to bow. I want you to remember that. To the glory. To the glory. Do you read the word glory there? To the honor of God the Father. They're not different. It's the same honor because it's the same God. Yeah. I'm going to help you out. John 1.14. No, 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 I'm sorry. I gave you wrong. Hebrews 1.3. <laughs> Who being. I don't know what people do with this verse, Pastor. Who being the brightness of his honor, being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his, what is that word? Person. There's not three. There's one. This is, Jesus is the brightness of his God's glory, the express image of God's person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sin, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. It's one throne. Right hand is figurative just like the rest. Figurative of what? Authority and power. When he purged our sin, he took that under his domain. Oh my goodness, I ain't got time for it. I ain't got time. Because we can read some more. John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his what? Use that word again. We beheld his honor. We beheld his glory. We got to see the glory of God, something that we seldom get to see. In the Old Testament, they did. Moses saw it. Moses says, let me see your glory, and got white hair for it. The backside of God blew Moses away. The Bible says that his glory filled the tabernacle in such a way that nobody could talk. Nobody could look. Everybody was on their hands and face. This is the glory. But somehow the glory has now come to us. The glory has been revealed to us through Jesus Christ. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The only one that was begotten. The only one. Everybody else is a good guy. Everybody else, Buddha is not God, he's a good guy. I think he was a good guy. You can disagree with me, it's okay. Muhammad, not a good guy, but if you keep with the point, he was a guy. Right? I want to take it closer. Brother David Bernard is a good guy. Brother Lee Stone King is a good guy. Brother Billy Cole was a good guy. You can put the word great there, and that'd be okay, too, as a matter of fact. 
but they weren't God. There's only one begotten, only one with the glory. The glory remains in one. It does not go anywhere else. He says, I have my glory. I will not give to another. That means another person, doesn't it? Oh, do you get it? Oh, get, I think we're getting there. How about the next one? How about the next one? John 17, 4 and 5. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have fulfilled your glory on the earth. Jesus is speaking. I have finished the work which thou gave me to do. Next verse. <clears throat> and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Next verse. Did I say next verse? Did I give you the next verse up there? Or did I just jump the gun? I jumped the gun. Thank you for jumping on it with me, but we don't need that verse. Will you go to Romans 3.23? <laughs> for all have sinned. Come short of the name. Huh? When we sin, we come short of the honor of God. We are not giving God the glory that he deserves. When I sin, I'm going to point my finger at me. I am not giving God the honor and glory that he deserves. Rightfully already belongs to him. The only one that it belongs to. We're on, are we on the same page? When I sin, I'm not just making a mistake for myself. Oh, oh. This is why Jesus needs to be the fullness of glory, because I'm going to need it, because I'm going to make a mistake I can't come back from. Did you know that every sin that you commit is a mistake you can't come back from? Every sin you commit, oh, but it was just a little white lie. I don't know why we're giving them colors. It's a lie. It's a little white lie. It's not a, what, what, a big brown one? What's the, what's the... It's just, it's what it is, is an attempt to try and make it pure. Using the word white to say holy or righteous or good or, no, it's a lie. A lie separates me from him. If it wasn't for his glory, it goes against his glory when I sin, but I, everybody has sinned. Everybody has come short of the glory. Flip. Where am I at? <clears throat> Romans eleven thirty six. From creation to Calvary. I hear things. I think I said it last week. I'm not sure if I did. I didn't mean to because it's supposed to be for this week, but I might have. The ground is level at the cross. You hear that phrase? The ground is level at the cross. And the, the, the indication is a good one, and that is it don't matter who you are. It don't matter what you've done wrong. You come to Calvary, and you can be forgiven. And it's absolutely true, but it's only half of what the statement means. The statement is true, but it means that the ground is level at the cross means nobody's walking up to it. But I've been a good person, not good enough for Calvary. I don't, I don't cuss. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't. I don't carouse. Is a word you used to use? It means have sexual relationship with people you're not married to, right? I don't. I don't. I don't do any. I don't. I've never murdered nobody. I love when people get to that. They'll do that. They'll, they'll say I'm a good person. I ain't never killed nobody. That's the. That's the limit. You better back that up a little. That's a little. That's a little. You know. That's shallow, right? Sister Shirley, we felt like killing people, but we don't do it. Yeah. We do this level stuff. But there's no levels at Calvary. It's one level. You come up on your hands and face or you don't come up at all. You don't get to come to Calvary looking up. You don't get to come to Calvary with a smile on your face. You don't come to Calvary doing a jig. You're not good enough to do that. All right, all right, point the, okay. You do this to yourself then. I'm not good enough to come to Calvary on my best day. 
on my, I've had some good days, on my best day, I don't deserve to walk up that hill. I don't. But the ground has been made level for me by the blood of Jesus. No matter what I've done or who I am, I come. We all come the same way. <laughs> the glory says you're not good enough, but I'll make a way for you to come. Anyway. 1 Corinthians, no, Ephesians 1, 17. Have we done that yet? Sure, I don't get ahead of myself. Did I read Romans eleven thirty six? Read Romans eleven thirty six. I haven't written down right. Romans eleven thirty six for of him and through him and to him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. He created you. He didn't have to save you after he created you just because we were a bunch of dummies and went off sin and doing the wrong thing. He could simply have just wiped the slate clean and started all over again. He could have took our choice away and turned us into robots, but he didn't want that. And since he's God, he's the one who gets to choose what he makes. How would you like to write a song and have somebody else come up to you and tell you how you're supposed to do the song? No. I had a song. I wrote it for Christmas. I took it to my son. I said, it ain't quite where it needs to be. Can you look at it and do it? And he worked on it and turned it to a real song. Because I gave him permission. But there were parts of it I didn't give you permission. And I said, don't change this. Change it. But I was just fine, but don't change And he didn't change it. Why? Because the song comes from me. And then, of course, after he added it, the song came from him. And that is nowhere near a good explanation. That's the best I got, but it's not a good explanation of what he's put into each and every one of you. He created you just like you are. So this nonsense that Hollywood feeds you about how you look and who's beautiful and who's not and how to get there. They don't know nothing about nothing. They don't know anything about what I'm talking about because they're not the creator. They're not the one that made you. They're literally looking at God every day and going, we can do better than you, and then doing worse. And then they go, see how, what a good job we did? Let's do more, and then they do worse than that. But unfortunately, the biggest part of their power is in us because we let them. We go, oh, yeah, you're right. I look terrible. My eyes are crossed. I got freckles all over my face. I don't know. I've, I've actually heard people tell me that. They're like, I'm not, I don't look good because I got all these freckles. I've never seen freckles that made somebody ugly. But that's what they, oh, oh why? Because somebody told them it. That's why. I was talking to somebody the other night. <laughs> Uh, about a kid, a little kid. And I was like, don't call them bad. Don't call them bad. Because if you call them bad enough, they're going to be bad. Call them good. When they do good, point it out. We're getting close to the point of the message. When they do good, point it out. But you see, brothers and sisters, the Lord did not impress this message on me because it was time to run around in circles. He has a point. And it's not a point for somebody out there. It's a point for all of you that are here this morning who are here by the grace and mercy of God and you managed to make it to Sunday morning service. Ephesians chapter 1, 17. Isn't that what I said? Ephesians 1, 17, yep. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. Next verse. The eyes of your understanding is what I'm hoping happens this morning through my terrible preaching. Being enlightened that you know what is the hope of his calling. What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Next verse. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. And there's a gleam here. There's an understanding here. I'm looking through those verses at all the things that God does through you and I. And it does not say what my flesh tells me it says. Every time. Every time I go to pray. Every time I go to worship. Every time I even read his word. Every time I get 
and go out and I'm a witness and a testimony. Every time I do anything for God, I have a misunderstanding hanging around ready to take His glory. And it doesn't belong to them. It doesn't belong to it. It belongs only to God. I think we covered that pretty clearly. 1 Corinthians 1.27 but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You weren't going to get here through intellectual discourse, but the foolishness of preaching. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Yeah, he said it. That's his word, not mine. So therefore, I'm weak. I'm a weak guy because he's called me to do this. You do know that, right? You're not preaching because you're better. You might be preaching because you're worse. He's using you as a sign of what he can do. <laughs> Next one. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. He does the reverse of what he did, creation. Oh, my goodness. I don't got time to preach that. I'd like the musicians to come. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory would be done away. Remember I told you about that. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? More glorious now whoo, than it was in the tabernacle. More glorious now than when Moses said, can I see your glory, and saw the backside of him. More glorious, theory, now. Filled with his spirit, more glorious now. We cannot take his glory. Everybody agrees with that, right? I can't take it when I preach, can't take it when I sing, can't take it. We can't even fathom what his glory is. And yet, we are mistakenly doing so on a regular basis. Everybody paying attention because this is the important part. All the rest of it just led to this. And you need to let the Holy Ghost and the Word of God do his work right now. Here it is. When I pray, Lord, I want you to heal me. And he heals you, and you give him glory for it. And then you say, Lord, I want you to heal me. And he doesn't, and you don't. Then it was not about his glory, but yours. When I praise and worship, I'm okay. We had some songs when I was growing up. We're, you know, really, I guess they were the best that we could do. I don't know. I'm really, honestly, the older ones were better and the ones after were better, my, my personal opinion. However, it was a lot about me. The songs were a lot about me. It was about, Lord, will you touch me? Lord, will you deal with me? And I, this revealed to me, my praise when I'm doing that is not glorifying him. It is making me the center of what's going on. And this is why I can't walk in that Ephesians and Corinthians walk. This is why I can't do it. Because it's about me. Does everybody in here know the Lord's Prayer? We were just at a funeral, and, and I didn't even know it was a, there was some cue that I'm not aware of. That they all were aware of. Because as soon as the minister, a man that I, I love dearly, as soon as he began to, as soon as he said whatever the cue was, they all started at the same time. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be. I mean, they're right into it. And I'm, I'm catching up. Well, it'll be thy name, the kingdom come. And I'm going, I'm back. Now I'm in the cadence. The earth is his. And they go through the whole of the Lord's Prayer. Right? Do you know that the previous scripture, right before he gets into the Lord's Prayer, says not to do vain repetitions? If you are mindlessly droning on about words that you were that you memorized, you are vainly repeating. Is exactly. I'm not knocking anybody. That's exactly what you're doing. 
the thing he said not to do. He said, pray in this wise. Pray like this. What he did was he gave you a recipe for proper prayer. And it starts like this. I lift you up. Not me. Not me. I said, how's it start? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Words that echo in the garden of Gethsemane when he says, nevertheless. Don't let this come past from me. There is depth in this understanding that my prayer is not supposed to be about me. My praise is not supposed to be about me. No. My testimony is not supposed to be about me. You say, well, I got to tell them my testimony. Yeah, about how God delivered you. You didn't do that. Would you stand with me this morning? The thing that we most are missing is that the center of every single thing we're doing is supposed to be giving glory to God. And here's how it will help you. Are you ready? I want you to listen. If you'll begin to live this kind of a life with your prayer, if you'll begin to live this kind of life with your worship, here's what's going to happen. You're going to stop questioning God about the decisions that he makes without consulting you. Your life is about to get a lot more simple than it has been up to this point because you've been struck. Listen to me. It's the Holy Ghost talking. This is all it's about. It's not me. Because you've been struggling with this understanding. Why didn't you heal? Why did you let them die? Why are you questioning God? Why aren't you giving him glory for whatever he did, knowing that he knows more than you, that he knew what he was doing, even if it can't be explained to you? <laughs> Brother, little star, I get what you're saying. I get what you, I hope you do. I get what you're saying, but I deserve an explanation. No, you don't. I do not deserve. I do not get what I deserve. If I got what I deserved. No, I don't even want to think about that. Nope. He is saying this morning, you want to live an overcoming life? Stop making it about yourself. Right now, today, heed the call of this message. This altar's open right now. Heed the call of this message. Lord, I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to put you for in the center of everything that I'm doing. And that means if you tell me no, I say, okay. If you tell me, nope, I'm not going to do it, I say, well, that's your will. Stop straining at gnats and swallowing camels. That means stop straining at those tiny pests. I got problems, Brother Star. I got faults, Brother Star. Why are you looking at them? Why, brother and sister, are you looking at them? Look at him. The only view you should have is him. And the reason you're struggling is because you're not doing it. I cannot preach this any better than I just did. I can't do it. But not everybody has responded this morning that should be responding. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, I'm not looking up. I'm not going to look at you. I'm not going to embarrass you. But you're not. He is speaking to you, but you're not listening. You're saying, whoa, I, I want to hold on to this. I want to hold on to it. And if I call on him, like the candy man, he'll just give me what I need. And you'll continue to struggle. You will continue to have depression in your life. You will continue to get out of a hasada. You'll continue to have anxiety, doubt, and fear in your life until you put him in the middle where he belongs. Nothing's going to work right. You're going to have to get to where Job was. Job wasn't desperate when he said this. He was faithful. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. you got to get where the, the Hebrew children, which were actually not children, the three Hebrew children, you got to get to where they were. Yo, king, live forever. If you throw us in the furnace, we're going to die. If he, he will deliver us. He has the power to deliver. But if he doesn't deliver us, we still won't bow. That is giving him the glory. Paul says it like this, that whether I'm present or absent, I'm with Christ. 
It doesn't matter what happens to me. Right now, close your eyes, everybody, all of you. This altar is open for everybody right now. And there are some that have not responded, but the Lord is reaching to you. He's very, being very emphatic with me about it. This altar is open for everybody right now. As we sing, would you seek his face? Would you call on his name? Would you tell him, I get it. You're God, and I'm not. And I want you to do your will. Come on. There's some Garden of Gethsemane moments right now for whoever's ready, whoever's willing. Let's sing.
even if you say no. I'm saying yes if you say wait. I'm saying yes no matter what happens. My circumstances don't dictate it. I'm saying yes. Matthew 6, when he's teaching, Jesus is teaching what we call the Lord's Prayer. When he gets to the end, what does he say? What's the wrap-up? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the what? And the glory forever. Nobody else gets it but you. Amen. That's the end of it. Let that be your prayer from now on, child of God. Jesus, you get the glory. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word this morning, and I thank you for your truth. I pray, oh Lord, today that every single person here has received that truth and will grow from it, that it's done the work you intended for it to do in every way, for you're the only one that knows, and you're the only one that can do it. You receive the glory this morning, and we will praise your name forever. When we get to heaven, we will lay our crowns at your feet because all of the glory belongs to you. It all belongs to you. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, let's lift him up and thank him right now. Praise him one more time.